I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Here in the 21st century, you're wearing cotton. You depend upon cotton. Cotton is a taken-for-granted commodity. Why? Where did it come from? And how does cotton begin to explain the expansion of the Industrial Revolution, in addition, the wealth that flowed to mother country, Great Britain, and then to the United States, within the reach of the founders. A new book, a wonderful, comprehensive, overwhelming, encyclopedic book from Sven Beckert. He's a professor at Harvard University. He's the Laird Bell Professor of History at Harvard University. It is entitled Empire of Cotton, A Global History. We live in global times. We think globally. It is a fascination to discover that this global product that we now take uh, for everyday use on the Internet came from the invention of institutions and governance. That's what we're going to get to. Professor, congratulations and good evening. And let us begin with the mystery to unravel, like a bale of cotton. In 1785, you, you write that a ship calling from America comes to Liverpool, the wonderful docks of Liverpool that look to be the crossroads of the earth when it comes to all commodities, but especially cotton. And it contains a bale or bales of cotton from uh, America, from the, the Southland of America. At first, it is doubted and it is regulated. It is confiscated because they believe they're smuggling it in from, say, the West Indies or Brazil. Why is this a surprise to them? How does it shock them? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. It's good to be with you. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting story. So as you mentioned, in 1785, a bale of cotton arrived in the port of Liverpool, and the customs authorities confiscated this bale of cotton because they thought it could not possibly be the growth of the uh, American South. Uh, the reason for that was that until uh, uh, the 1780s, uh, what would later become the United States, uh, was not much of a presence uh, within the global cotton industry. Uh, In the 1780s, there was already the beginnings of mechanized cotton production in uh, the United Kingdom, but also in France. And at this point, uh, all cotton uh, coming into the European cotton industry originated either from uh, the Ottoman Empire, especially from Western Anatolia, or to some degree uh, from India and West Africa, but mostly it came from the West Indies and Brazil. And so when that bale of cotton arrived in 1785 on a ship from, uh, from, uh, the South, from, from North America, uh, the customs authorities could not even imagine that it would be the growth uh, of, uh, of that part of the world. And of course, as we know, very soon thereafter, the United States becomes the dominant force in the growing of cotton globally, or better to say the growing of cotton for export globally. And today we take that part uh, of our history for granted, and very few people remember that there was a time when uh, uh, very little cotton was grown in what is now the United States and where most cotton manufactured was grown in other parts of the world. We're going to come back to that bale of cotton. I want to freeze it one more moment in everyone's mind. I read from the professor that at this point, 1791, approximately when that bale of cotton arrived in Liverpool, 85% of cotton used for manufacturing came from small farmers in Asia, Africa, and South America. America wasn't even in the game at 1791. Right. And it's, that tra- it's, the, it's the ability to industrialize the American Southland's ability to ro- grow cotton that creates, Professor, not only the clothes we wear, but it creates banking, shipping, and government. Is that the, are those the themes you're developing? Yes. I, so, so, so one of the core arguments of my book is that, uh, that, the, uh, that the modern world in which we live today, not just in the United States, but also in basically all other parts of the world, originates with the emergence of capitalism and especially in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. And at the core of that Industrial Revolution and with it, the history of capitalism, is this one commodity that came right. first, namely cotton. Cotton. Now, let's go back to the beginning. 5,000 years, we peel the layers back. Cotton is a commodity that's grown in the cotton belt, the south. 
about 32 to 35 degrees south, correct me if I get this wrong, Professor, 37 degrees north. And that's been, that reaches back to the Paleolithic. They've always grown cotton. It grows tall. They can pick it. And that describes cotton for not not just our ancestors, but reaching way back to the Romans and the Greeks. That's where they got their cotton. And they we they turned it into th- uh, to yarn and then weaved it home. That's that's cotton until what in the 18th century? Why is right. cotton? Attra- why was cotton attractive? How 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 did it come to compel the courts and the elites of the earth? Yeah, that is uh, that is really an excellent question. And and the book deals mostly. I would say 80 percent of the book deals with the time period between approximately 1780 and then into the 20th century, so when cotton becomes really important to modern industrialization and modern capitalism. But it is really important uh, to understand that the, uh, that the history of cotton goes much back much further, as you mentioned. It goes back approximately 5,000 years. There was a vibrant uh, cotton industry uh, in uh, basically three parts of the world, in, uh, in um, Eastern Africa, in uh, what is now uh, uh, Central America, and somewhat into South America, and then especially in South Asia. And uh, these industries emerged uh, at slightly different points in time, but they began to emerge approximately 5,000 years ago, and they were uh, vibrant, and they were large. Indeed, they were by, uh, by the year 1,000, of, uh, of, uh, uh, 1, 000, uh, um, uh, about 1,000 years ago, they were already the largest manufacturing industry that existed anywhere in the world. So this is way before industrialization. This is 800 years before industrialization, and that is also way before Europeans uh, and North Americans, for that matter, had anything really to do with this cotton industry. This was an industry that uh, thrived uh, mostly uh, on, uh, on, on small farms, and, 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 and it was based on uh, household manufacturing. Women were spinning yarn in front of their uh, huts in India and Africa and Central America, and uh, it were often men who wove it then into cloth. Uh, but but this industry was very significant and it was very vibrant. It expanded uh, con- constantly. It expanded from South Asia into East Asia, such as into China. It, in, it expanded also into West Asia. It expanded from East Africa to West Africa, and it expanded also from Central America a little bit further north, and then also further south into South America. So this was a vibrant industry. And though most of what was produced was not only manufactured in households but also used in households, some of it did enter a trade, and sometimes even long-distance trade. And so you mentioned the the fact that the the Romans and the Greeks knew about cotton textiles. The cotton textiles that they knew about had been manufactured in India, and they were traded uh, through the Indian Ocean and uh, then up through... uh, uh, through the Arab world in, in, into uh, the ancient Greek and, and then into the Roman world. The one part of the world, in a way, that was not really integrated into these uh, networks of production and trade was the continent of Europe. And so it's, of course, a great irony that by uh, approximately the mid-19th century, Europe would come to dominate this particular industry that it had been marginal to for so long. A detail here, GMO naturally. Uh, You write that the farmers experimented with seeds and they made it possible for cotton to grow in cooler climates and more arid climates. That suited Islam. So early on, they understood that in order to spread the wealth and spread the opportunity, they needed to change the original cotton. Later on, you'll see this happen in the 19th century, 18th century, 19th century in America when they go to larger bowls. So was there a cotton magic here? Did people have this special knowledge and they traveled with it? Were there industrial well, let's put it this way. Were there secrets that were stolen from kingdom to kingdom? Um, I mean, p- partly, uh, yes. I think uh, the, 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 the spread of, the, of cotton agriculture itself was certainly informed by the migration of, uh, of, of people, but also skills uh, uh, across uh, significant distances. And, uh, of course, this is a process that unfolded. As I mentioned, it began approximately 5,000 years ago, and it unfolded in the, in the next 4,000 or 4,500 years. So this is a process that, you know, c- considering our current 
speed of economic change uh, was uh, was 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 relatively slow. But nonetheless, there was a migration of skills and uh, and also of seed uh, that uh, that uh, that allowed for the spread of cotton agriculture. The same is the case with uh, with technology. For example, the spinning wheel would eventually arrive in Europe, and it arrived in Europe approximately in the 12th century, but it came uh, from, from, from China and from South Asia. So there is, uh, so there is, uh, the, 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 there is a, the, one of the constants in this industry, you know, and this certainly goes to the contemporary moment, even though the speed of change has, of course, increased drastically, is that, uh, that there is a spread of biological matter of seed, uh, there is a spread of skill, and then there's a spe- uh, spread of technology as well. I'm speaking with Professor Sven Beckert. He is the Laird Bell Professor of History at Harvard University. His new book is Empire of Cotton, A Global History. Remember that bale of cotton in 1785? We're going to get back to it. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. It's a great fr- privilege to speak to Professor Sven Beckert, Laird Bell Professor of History at Harvard University, and most importantly, the author of a new book, Empire of Cotton, that is what I think to be the way we should go forward in writing about how we put the world together many times globally. This subtitle, Global History, speaks to the institutions we take for granted in the 21st century. We've gotten to Europe in the about 10th, uh, for, at the end of the first millennium. And, Professor, you write that cotton found its home. Home spinning and uh, cra- uh, crafts were where it was manufactured, nothing industrial. But it was especially welcomed in northern Italy and southern Germany. Well, strikingly, these were the same areas that had wool bases, uh, but they had access to raw cotton. Is that when Venice became important as well? Right. This is a, basically, this is very much linked to the rise of Venice. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned, uh, there is, uh, the, the cotton came relatively late to Europe in comparison to, to other parts of the world. Uh, and it, uh, it came late to Europe uh, partly because uh, the Europeans faced a very big problem. They couldn't grow cotton uh, on the continent of Europe uh, for climactic reasons. And, uh, and so it was only in the 12th century with the expansion of European powers into the eastern Mediterranean, an area in which there was not only a thriving cotton industry, but also thriving cotton agriculture, that Europeans for the first time got access to raw cotton in significant quantities. And it was the Venetians and the Genoese who uh, exported it to Italy. And it was in the 12th century that for the first time, a cotton industry began to emerge in Europe. It built, as you mentioned, upon older industries, especially upon the wool industry, which had a much, much longer history uh, in Europe, but, uh, and it expanded significantly. It became quite important to northern Italian cities and then later also to cities in southern Germany. But it was, in, at this point, it was neither important uh, in, a, in a kind of general way to the European textile industry, which remained to be mostly based in the production of wool and linen clothing. And the little cotton industry that at this point began to emerge in Europe was also quite signi- insignificant if we compare it with the cotton industry that was then flourishing, let's say, in South Asia. Now we come to a concept that begins to explain the transformation. Remember now, cotton doesn't grow in Europe. How is it that Europe comes to dominate this story? Professor, what is war capitalism? How do we understand it with, ter- with, with regard to cotton? So the great puzzle uh, that, that, that the history of the, of the global cotton industry raises, and with it also more broadly the history of the world and then also the history of capitalism, is of course why does this part of the world that is so inconsequential and so unimportant to uh, these, this, what I argued, is the most dynamic and most important manufacturing industry that exists anywhere in the world, how does this part of the world, Europe, become suddenly so important to this industry and so important eventually that it comes to dominate uh, the global uh, cotton industry. And of course, a story that we have been telling for a long time and that on the face of it seems also to be quite persuasive 
is that Europeans in the course of the 18th century, but then especially in the 1770s, 1780s, came to invent new machines. And these machines increased the productivity of uh, the spinning and weaving of cotton dramatically. But there is one problem, and this is we need to answer of why Europeans developed the idea of wanting to invent new machines to produce cotton fabrics, because after all, as I mentioned before, the industry was uh, uh, not particularly important to Europe, and Europe was not particularly important to this global industry. And so what I'm finding in my research is that it was really that there's, there's something that came before the invention of machines. And what came before the invention of machines is that Europeans, beginning in the 16th century, but then especially in the late 17th and during the 18th century, come to dominate global cotton networks, global networks of cotton production and cotton trade, way before they themselves become an important part in the manufacturing of cotton textiles. And That's is, what you this, mean by the land grab, Professor. The land right, grab is so, on. Right. And this, so this is what I call war capitalism. Europeans begin to find ways to integrate territories that are far removed from the continent of Europe, uh, especially the Americas, and uh, they do that by removing native populations from, uh, from these territories. That gives them suddenly access to huge amounts of land that is suitable for the growing of cotton. At the same time, Europeans become uh, very involved in, as you know, in the global uh, slave trade, and so thus they are able to uh, uh, mobilize workers for the growing of cotton that, uh, that, 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 without having to affect any changes within the European countryside. And at the same time, uh, they send uh, heavily armed merchants into, uh, the, 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 into the Indian Ocean, into India, and those other parts of the world in which they begin to dominate the trade in cloth, a trade that at that point was already perhaps 2,000 years old. And Europeans begin increasingly to settle in these parts of the world, so they began, become also uh, political rulers in, 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 in parts of Asia. They acquire a knowledge of manufacturing technologies, something that, that they were not necessarily aware of before this point in time. They learn how to manufacture the high-quality cottons that come out of uh, the homes of the South Asian weavers. And uh, they begin also to understand that this is a major industry and that there are tremendous markets for these products. And these markets are both uh, clearly visible in areas such as South Asia or Africa, where cotton cloth comes to play a very important role in the slave trade. They're important because they close the, the, they close the, the, the slaves in the Americas. But also in Europe itself, Europeans are beginning to develop a taste for cotton fabrics, most of which were imports from India. So for anybody with... Uh, with, with capital at hand, and uh, uh, it was clear that these were, this was a very important industry and that it was very dynamic and that, it, uh, that, that there were potentially huge markets if somehow you would find a way to enter also the, uh, the, the enter production of these cotton uh, f uh, fabrics. And this is then something that happens through these new machines uh, in, in the uh, 1780s. Uh, it is now the 18th century, 1753. A bales of cotton arrive at Liverpool, and there's no place in the world to export the making of goods. That's going to be transformed along with war capitalism and the institutions that drive it. The book is The Empire of Cotton, A Global History. Sven Beckert is the author. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Professor Sven Beckert is here. He is the Laird Bell Professor of History at Harvard University. His new book is Empire of Cotton. We're telling the story of the suddenness of the transformation to a commodity that was much admired and sought after by the elites and by well-to-do. Remember, people didn't change their clothes in the medieval ages. They wore out what they had, and it was mostly wool if they were lucky to get it or homespun. What we're looking at now is 
cotton, the cotton bowl, suddenly in the middle of the 18th century, goes to not only dominate the earth with peace goods, yarn and peace goods, but also generate capital, and capital grows the fleets, the governance, and it changes the governance, if I follow the professor's argument. And so we now are in the middle of the 18th century. The Americas are a dependent colony on Great Britain, and also France, and Sp- uh, the Spanish dominate the South, uh, South America. There are nascent cotton producers that are critical here, and they're developing... We go to a, a detail in the professor's books. This is building more capitalism. Remember, they'll land grab first, and then what to do with it. In 1753, 26 ships arrive at the port of Liverpool from Jamaica. On board are, tw- are 24 uh, bags of fiber, cotton on board. But there's nothing to do with it. They don't know quite how to make money of it. How do they figure this out, professor? Who's there, and who is Mr. Gregg? So, um... So, by the in the in the in the, in the course of the 18th century, the, so, so what's what's important to understand that in the course of the 18th century, there is already an expansion of cotton manufacturing in uh, Great Britain. This is after the medieval period that we talked about earlier, the first time that Europe now becomes a major presence or a significant presence in the global uh, cotton industry. And the great problem that Europeans uh, face at this point is again that the, that the European continent is not suitable for the growing. Uh, of cotton. And so the cotton, uh, if there is to be a, a cotton industry in Europe, needs to be secured from elsewhere. And as I mentioned, it is first uh, secured from, from, from parts of the world such as Western Anatolia or India, where that cotton is grown by peasant labor. So peasants just grow a little cotton, and this is traded with merchants, and these merchants bring it to the port, and, this port, uh, and so then some European merchant purchases it and brings it uh, to Liverpool, as you just described. But, but it was very difficult to expand the production of raw cotton uh, by peasant labor, because most peasants also wanted to produce cotton for their own home manufacturing, and many peasants also needed to grow food crops to be able to survive. And so what happens in the course of the 18th century, that Europeans invent a new system of growing cotton. And really, for the first time, large cotton plantations emerge. The monocultural growing of cotton emerges. And this all happens in these newly captured territories of the Americas, first in the West Indies and then in Brazil. And the labor that is used for that growing of cotton is slave labor. And that now enables a very dynamic, a very a flexible expansion of the inexpensive production of raw cotton for European, uh, for European industry. And it's really this influx of raw cotton, as you just described, for example, from Jamaica, that provides now a cheap, reliable source of raw materials for industrial production. Of course, at the beginning, this system is very uh, unstable and, uh, and is, 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 is a kind of grand experimentation. Nobody has ever done anything like this before. Here we are connecting now manufacturers in England with uh, cotton growers in the Americas, with slaves from Africa and consumers all over the world. This is truly the world's first truly global industry that is beginning to emerge, and nobody really knows how to do this at this point. And it's really merchants who play a very significant role in creating these kinds of connections between distant places and, and, and very different sets of people, and that now allow uh, the products of uh, African workers in Jamaica, for example, to be traded uh, uh, to the port of Liverpool to be used in a manufacturing enterprise in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, 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 in the city of of Manchester. There are striking facts here. We have to start with the West Indies and Brazil, two conquered lands that at first they're in the in the cotton band of the earth seem to suit. However, you write, Professor, that the sugar plantations were much more bountiful for Europeans. I think France built its palaces on the on the on the on the, the profit right. of the sugar right. plantations. Right. And the, so that the West Indies didn't at first offer a place for uh, lots of new land. In fact, the only people growing cotton on the established parts of the West Indies were those who didn't have the capital to start a sugar plantation. But they went to the new West Indies. I think Barbados, you mentioned, Tobago, and also the French went to Saint-Domingue. So they were exploring new land. They were always in a land grab. And that was compelling to the merchants, because if you had cheap land and cheap labor, you could make money. 
Right, right, right. This is uh, this is uh, this is exactly. Uh, this is exactly the process. Uh, the, the, the West Indies were the first part of the world in which this uh, new way of uh, uh, growing cotton emerged, uh, partly exactly as you mentioned, because of this history in sugar production. So people had experiences about how to both mobilize the land and the labor for the production of agricultural commodities. Then, of course, there were already thriving merchant communities in these parts of the world, and there were established trade links between the West Indies and, uh, uh, and, and, and European Ports, but there were also certain limits to it. And as you mentioned, this was uh, uh, the, that the the, uh, the West Indies uh, had uh, limited territory, and they also had uh, uh, a thriving sugar industry. And investments in sugar production were very expensive. And so most planters who had invested in sugar were reluctant to retool to go into uh, cotton production. And it is at this point that this industry be- moves uh, at first into Brazil. And then, as we mentioned earlier, also moves uh, into uh, the southern United States. Right, and that's going to be the tipping point here, to use a modern terminology. But we'll come to that because I want to develop how the British merchants saw cotton as an add-on. You mentioned, I think it's the Tarleton brothers, are those the slavers who, as a sideline to their business, develop cotton, almost as if they were experimenting and trying to uh, distribute their income in some fresh way to ride out the, the bubble, the rise and fall of slave prices. Did that attract other merchants when they saw slavers doing well in cotton? Right. So, so you know, most merchants in the 18th century were kind of general merchants. They, they didn't specialize necessarily in one particular product. They dealt in all kinds of products. Sometimes they specialized in certain regions of the world, such as the West Indies, but they, but they would uh, transport whatever there was a market for from that part of the world to, uh, to Europe and, and vice versa. And of course, when... Uh, the, the, the port of Liverpool, in particular, was one of the most important slaving ports uh, in the uh, in the United Kingdom, and uh, uh, of course, when demand increased because of the beginning uh, emergence of an industrial cotton uh, production in Great Britain, uh, these these merchants understood that these factories now needed uh, much larger quantities of cotton, and if they had uh, the ability to acquire such cotton in uh, the ports that they traded with, and if they still had some space left in their boats, then they would uh, would uh, would also purchase that cotton and bring it to the port of Liverpool. But there were no specialized merchants at first. These were no. these were generalists who saw cotton opportunities. And there are about to be a conversation between the American, the new republic in America, which you remember, it's in a revolutionary period here, between the middle of the 18th century and then the uh, the Declaration of Independence, the War of Revolution, the Peace of Paris, and finally the Constitution. There are people who are going to cast their eyes at the American Southland. That's not obvious. I want to know whether it was the Liverpool merchants who saw the American Southland or whether it was the American plantation owners who saw the advantages. Is, is, is that a distinction without a difference? Who came first, Professor? Uh, that is a very difficult but very excellent question. Um, I, I think it's a mutually reinforcing uh, process. Um, I think first uh, comes uh, the enormous expansion of cotton manufacturing in uh, the United Kingdom, especially in the 1780s and 1790s when it, it is virtually exploding. It's, 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 I think the best comparison we have for that would be the Internet boom right. of the 1990s. Right. Or so. this, is a, this is the industry that suddenly emerges. It's something that has never happened in human history before. And, uh, you know, anybody with any capital is going to go into this industry, and, uh, and, and people are making fortunes in this industry. The return on capital is very high. And thus the demand for cotton, raw cotton, suddenly increases drastically. It becomes difficult to, uh, to gain access to those quantities of cotton that are suddenly needed in Europe at the prices that uh, merchants and manufacturers are willing to pay uh, from the old sources that are available. And so as a result, prices of raw cotton increase significantly in the 1780s and 1790s. So it becomes more expensive for these manufacturers to purchase cotton. At the same time, 
as you know, in the early 1790s, in the wake of the French Revolution, there is a huge upheaval and eventually a revolution on the island of Saint-Domingue, the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which at this point is the single most important provider of raw cotton to European industry. And as a result, uh, prices increase even further, and uh, manufacturers and merchants are looking out for new uh, suppliers of the cotton that they need for their factories. At the same time, in the United States, in the just emerging United States, there is a significant decline of tobacco agriculture in the, uh, uh, in the n- n- northern states of the, of the south, uh, partly exactly as a result of the of the of the of the revolution, and so um, planters are looking for new crops that they can produce and sell on world markets. Crops that both can uh, use the land that they own, uh, but but especially deploy the labor that they own, namely uh, all that those slaves who had grown tobacco on American plantations. And it is really at this moment that both the the, the, the search of, of European mark, uh, merchants for raw cotton supplies, as well as the search of American land and labor owners, plantation owners, uh, to have new markets uh, for the products that they grow, can grow in the American South, that they coincide. And once they coincide, they begin to reinforce one another because uh, uh, the, the Liverpool and then Le Havre and other European cities that import cotton become increasingly dependent on those supplies coming from the United States. And at the same time, uh, American plantation owners become increasingly dependent on uh, these European cotton markets. And it's really at this point that for the first time, there are merchants who now begin to specialize right, decisively right, right. in cotton. I'm speaking to Professor Sven Beckert of Harvard. His new book is Empire of Cotton, A Global History. When we come back, there's a man whose opinion is vital to this in the United States, and then we're going to follow the major institutions that are generated because of the success of cotton. The man I'm talking about, of course, is George Washington. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Sven Beckert, his new book is Empire of Cotton, A Global History. This is the story from 5,000 years, but right now we're in this critical period, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and Great Britain that has no cotton. It doesn't grow any, but it's about to transform the raw cotton from conquered lands, former colonies, into the ability to generate capital that will build fleets and change the governance of Great Britain profoundly in the 19th century, sometimes to the good, sometimes to the revolutionary. And, Professor, you make a point that it's not the technology that drives this, it's the institutions of state power. So we need to start with one particular institution of state power in the United States and explain the prescience. You quote from George Washington, the quote is, the increase of that new material, cotton, must be of almost infinite consequence to the prosperity of the United States. He was a large plantation owner. Did the Virginians follow the, uh, the not yet president of the United States? Or was this a general opinion that the, uh, the founding fathers recognized that cotton was a way to grow their success? Uh, I think the, the, the you know the young United States faced uh, one very significant problem. It, it the, 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 um, the British colonies of North America had benefited greatly from being part of the imperial system dis- devised by Great Britain. They had also suffered from it in some ways, but but they had also benefited from it, mostly because it gave them access to very large and significant and protected markets for the things that they grew in North America. Now, with the revolution, all of these benefits were suddenly gone, and, uh, the, um, uh, and uh, the, the new ways of, of integrating the now uh, just built United States into the global economy uh, had to be devised. And um, 
one of the ways of how the United States became important to the global economy already by the late 18th century, but then especially in the 19th century, was its, uh, its uh, specialization in the production of cotton for world markets. Indeed, the United States in the first half of the 19th century mattered principally to the global economy only because it produced vast amounts of raw cotton for European factories. What we're looking at then is the U.S. suddenly, accidentally, on purpose, becomes the cheap land combined with the cheap labor. The professor has an astonishing fact I've read before, but it was never compared to profit. It's that half of all slaves uh, transported from Africa to the United States arrived after 1780. That's right. Between 1780 and 1888 is half of all the slaves. Why? For cotton. And they came to all of the new Americas, but chiefly the transport, the, the transit routes were used in South America onto uh, onto the United States, and a, a, a dominant amount of the slaves went to the large plantation owners, where 85 percent of all cotton. I know these are a lot of numbers, but you see, they're creating the raw material for the profit in Europe. And I want to touch upon that, Professor, before we come yeah. back to the United States. Samuel right. Gregg is, yeah. the, is the genius who puts a factory together to deal with these bales of cotton. Who is he? Where did he get his money? How did he understand it? I mean, Samuel Gregg is one of the first uh, uh, people in the United Kingdom, not the first one, but one of the first ones, who uh, invests in the mechanized spinning of cotton. So the, the production of cotton with uh, water-powered spinning machines in factories. Um, he, is, um, uh, he comes out of a family that was tightly linked to the Liverpool merchant community, a family that was already investing and engaged with the home-based manufacturing of cotton textiles as it unfolded in the, uh, in the British countryside. And he comes from a family which owned uh, 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 plantations in the West Indies. And uh, it is in the 1780s that uh, all these factors come together in the person of Samuel Gregg, and he builds uh, a, a, a relatively large a spinning mill uh, a few miles outside the city of uh, Manchester. But he's just one of many. There are many other uh, people at this point in time who begin to uh, build factories, which is really the first time in human history that factories are built, uh, begin to invest in water-powered uh, machinery, and thus begin to revolutionize, really, the global cotton industry. His wife's money is slave money. In fact, much of the capital he uses is slave money. And this is an important theme for you, that slavery's capital also becomes the way to generate what becomes a called wage slavery. They're going to transform working class. They're going to invent the working class, and they're going to use governance to do it. Did I read you correctly? Right. I mean, it's obviously it, what is very, very important is to see that the, the, the way how labor is, is, is mobilized in the Americas and, uh, and in Europe is, is very, very different. The, the conditions of wage workers in early cotton factories was, as uh, I'm sure everybody knows, quite terrible. But it was distinctly different from the uh, system of, of actual slavery as it was uh, deployed in uh, the American South and in Brazil and the West Indies to grow cotton for these factories, but uh, but I think it's uh, it, it is it is it is it is true, and I'm arguing that uh, that the system of of slavery, partly because it was the one system of labor mobilization that actually produced significant quantities of cheap cotton for export markets was essential and was in some ways at the core of the industrial takeoff that would later take place uh, in Europe and then, of course, also in, in the United States. And uh, the detail we're making here, again, is that these profits create institutions of state power. That's the revolution here, and we're going to talk about that when we come back. I'm speaking to Professor Sven Beckert, Empire of Cotton. We're going to talk about the technology. Yes, that's a fascination. The professor uses the metaphor of the Internet. But the technology does not create the capital. The technology is a product of the state power 
that creates the ability for merchants to raise themselves up as political class members and then create the capital that creates the technology. The book is...